Last week we met Abraham, which opened up a whole family of faith. Uh, it said, by faith, Abraham was called of God. He obeyed. He left his father. He left his relatives, left his country. He went to a land that God appointed unto him, and God promised that he would bring about, through the descendants of Abraham, the descendants in number as the sand of the sea and the stars of the sky. God miraculously brings about Isaac through his wife Sarah when she has not been able to have a child her whole life and is now older in age. Isaac comes along, and the Bible says in verse 20, it runs down a few generations of Abraham's family. By faith, Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau, Isaac's two twin boys, even regarding things to come. He shared with them the promises of God still yet to be realized. We here this morning have a lot of promises of God, some yet to be realized, the best ones yet to be realized, resurrected into eternal glory, for example, evil eradicated from this world, judged by Almighty God. Wickedness condemned and removed from the world and God establishing his throne and his kingdom in a new heaven and a new earth where there is no more pain, no more crying, and no more death. That is a promise yet to come, but we pass that on generation to generation and it holds us steadfast in the storm of the present. Things to come, verse 21. By faith, Jacob, as he was dying, blessed each of the sons of Joseph. That's Jacob's son, Joseph, and worshiped Jacob, leaning on the top of his staff. He's an older man, close to death. The Bible says he sat up in his bed. He gathered his strength. Joseph came to see him on his deathbed. If you ever want to read it, it's in Genesis chapter 48. Joseph came to see him, and he brings his two boys, Manasseh and Ephraim. Someone comes in to Jacob, old man. He says, your son is here. Joseph is here. He's got his boys with him. Sir. The Bible says he gathers everything he has and he, he sits up barely. He gathers all the strength he has and he sits up in bed. And he blesses Joseph and he said, God has walked with me. He says, God has been the shepherd all the days of my life. And he blesses Joseph and he blesses those two boys and he reminds them not to forget the promises of God about things to come. Jacob. And then it says in verse 22, by faith, Joseph, years later when he was dying at the age of 110, made mention of the exodus of the sons of Israel and gave orders concerning his bones, his own bones, knew, knowing that he would not see the promised land. He was down in Egypt before the days of Moses. Genesis chapter 50, if you want to read it sometime. He was down in Egypt and he was 110 years old and he was coming to the end of his life and he knew that God had said, you're going to go over there, your generation sooner or later is going to go over there and they're going to possess the land that I promised. Joseph knew he wasn't going to see it. He was down in Egypt and he reminds his brothers and his family, gathers them around his deathbed and he says, listen, I'm not going to make it, but God's going to fulfill his promise because when God speaks, it will be so Still true, when God has delivered his word, that's what's going to happen, and that's what forever shall be. When the Bible says, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet, and the trumpet of God shall sound, says the dead in Christ will rise first, and that's what's going to happen. We which are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will be caught up in the air to meet the Lord, and so shall we forever be with the Lord. That's what's going to happen. Now, I might lay on my deathbed and pass that promise on, having yet to see that, but that's what's going to be so. Joseph said, I'm not going to see the promised land just yet, but you guys are going to, and when you do, you dig my bones up out of this land of Egypt and carry me and bury me over there because I'm coming with you. And they were like, oh, okay. They made them swear. He said, you swear it. Oh, let's just read it. It's in Genesis 50. I wasn't going to read it. It's really fun. I'm having fun. Okay. I think I got it. Do I have 50? No. Well, I'll read it anyway. It's exciting. 
<laughs> no, man, you don't have it. You're really excited. Genesis chapter 50 and verse 24. You know, if you ever need to find something not on the screen, which it is today, <laughs> go ahead and find that in your Bible. Joseph said to his brothers, I'm about to die. But God will surely take care of you and bring you up from this land to the land which he promised on oath to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. Verse 25, Joseph made the sons of Israel swear, saying, look, he quotes, say it, say this, God will surely take care of you and you shall carry my bones up from there, up from here. You tell me that. We will carry your bones up from here. Okay, then. He punches out. Oh. <sighs> What you have here in Hebrews 11 are what I like to think of as baton carriers. You have baton carriers in your life. Somebody handed you faith. Maybe you're the first one. Maybe you're the first leg of the race. Maybe you've recently found Christ and nobody before you in your family. I don't know. But either way, we have either received or we are carrying and about to give the baton of the faith of our gospel and the Lord Jesus Christ. Some of us, I have baton carriers in my life. Older men and women that have gone before me that have demonstrated what it looked like to follow the Lord faithfully, that have spoken the word of God and declared what God has sworn by oath are the promises of things yet to come. That has inspired my heart. I have received the Lord Jesus as my Savior. My sins are forgiven. I have the promise of my own resurrection from the dead by the voice of Almighty God that brought Lazarus from the grave. And now it is my turn and your turn to carry that baton of faith, to demonstrate what it is, to declare his promises, to walk by faith, not by sight, and show the next generation to come what that looks like. And the day may likely come when you and I are like Joseph and about to die, and we remind them what God has sworn by oath to those of us who believe. This is a family that passed it from generation to generation to generation, and they carried it. And here we are today, and it's our turn. I think of a relay race, maybe four by 100, my favorite. Fast, four people, 100 meters apiece, baton, never supposed to lose speed as it goes around the track. The runners stop and start. They build up speed, slow down speed, and come to a halt. But the idea is the baton is never to stop. The next runner in the race sees the person coming. They hit the mark on the track that is the takeoff mark. And they begin to sprint looking forward. They put their hand back, grab the baton, and they pick it up and they run. And they run that baton. And that person's race is done. But now it's this person's turn. And they are to carry it with everything they've got until they're done. Somebody handed it. A generation before us handed it to us. We have believed, taken the baton of the gospel, and it is now up to us to run with everything we've got. Everything we've got until we cross the line and hand it to the next generation and pass into heaven and hopefully hear, well done, good and faithful servant. You ran well. These guys are baton carriers. The Bible says in Psalm 78, that they wrote things down. They had a testimony of what God was that they were going to pass. This is what God did. This is what, this is what we believed in the Lord for. This is what God said. This is where God showed up. This is where we saw his power. This is where we wrestled struggle. Needed mercy. This is where we saw the Lord. And they wrote it down. And they gave the reason they wrote it down, Psalm 78, 6, that the generation to come might know, even the children yet to be born, that they may arise and tell them to their children that they should put their confidence in God and not forget the works of God, but keep his commandments. That the next generation, it says, may arise. Maybe in this room, there's a generation that's been running for a long time. Some of you have been running for a long time. Whether you've been running with everything you've got or faithfully, diligently in holiness and righteousness, I don't know. Only you and the Lord know. I won't stand before him to be judged for you. Only you will, and I'll stand before him for what I did. But you're running, and you're carrying the baton. Whether in excellence or mediocrity 
or poorly, I do not know. But you're carrying the baton if you know Christ. Then you're reaching the end, perhaps. You're coming to the closing steps of your point in the race. And then there might be a different generation in here. I'm sure there is. Brand new, young, vigorous, growing in their faith, recently received Jesus, young in age, strong in strength. And you're about to receive it totally and take it and run. The handoff is happening right before our very eyes. That's why we put these young people up here and do things. So I, I, I don't fight battles about shorts and t-shirts and flip-flops. and these, I, don't, I don't care about any of that. Do they know Christ? Are they faithful to the word of God? Are they faithful to the gospel? Are they going to carry it and carry it well? That's why I don't care when they make mistakes. So I put young preachers that I believe there might be a call of God in their life and put them in front of you to preach the word of God. Somebody did that for me. Somebody recognized that it was time for them to hand it and handed it to me. There are men of God in my life that handed that off and said, it's your turn. And I got up and at times made a mess. <laughs> made a mess. Said crazy things. Shouldn't have said all that. <laughs> Gave illustrations that were, you know, highly undignified in the pulpit. They shouldn't have said that. Why, you know, watch people squint. Ooh, oh, that's, he's not coming back from that. You know, it's, it's like, <laughs> made mistakes. That was the handoff process, Right? That was a hand up, but the, the, the Lord was with it. The Lord was calling me. And what's the Bible say? Correction, reproof, rebuke, exhort, exhortation, and ra- training in righteousness. Trained in I took the baton, and now I'm running. And I don't know how far I, I'm, God's going to let me run, but I'm running with everything I've got. But I'm already looking to the guy for the next lap. I don't know who they are, who they might be, young men and women here. You take this, and then you cross over, and you're out. That's why we do that. That's why we have little kids do jobs in the church. Because I know we don't like to look, think about it. I know I've been saying this a lot lately. We're all going to be dead. Maybe Jesus comes tonight. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Descend from heaven with a shout. Come quickly, Lord Jesus. But if he doesn't, there's going to be another generation that's going to need to go tell people that. I keep a baton. It's right here. Literally. I keep this journal. I just wanted to, I'm not telling you like this is a Bible verse says keep a journal or anything. I'm not saying that. Just uh, working through some things. The message today. Oh, several years ago here at The Rock, uh, somebody, more than one person kept saying or kept asking. They would hear of testimonies of God's power. See, this, this is not my biography, okay? I, I, that, that doesn't matter. We, we, here, here's the biography we need, okay? When I'm gone, I, no one better name anything after me. I've told my wife. I've given very specific instructions. When I'm dead, I want to be all the way dead and forgotten so someone can run free of me. Okay, I don't, I don't need any of that. So that's a different thing. So here's this. This is a testimony of times that we have seen God's power, that I have experienced the Lord some of it is times of great struggle in the ministry, in my personal life, my faith. Struggle with the Lord. God, I need you. God, I'm desperate. I am afraid. There are words in here that I am, Lord, I am scared to death. God, I don't know what to do. Only you can do this now. God, I give you glory and praise for what we've seen. I can't believe this happened. And I, I, years, people kept asking me, are, they would see the Lord work. They would see people come to Christ. They would see people get baptized. They would see the church be touched by the power of the Holy Spirit. They kept saying, are you writing this down? I was like, no. I remember years ago, there was a, guy I became friends with, uh, basically a declared atheist, almost, not almost, militant, pretty militant, came, sat down with me in my office, told me what he thought of God and the word of God. It was lots of fun. 
His kids were coming to the church. His wife was coming to the church. She would sit alone in church, and uh, one day he came to see me, large, imposing fellow, very intelligent, engineer brain, different kind of brain. I don't have it. You know, they can, they can look at you and, like, do, like, logical laps around you and push you into a corner, bully you, slap the books out of your hand. Come on, skinny punk, you know. And it's like, and it's what he came to do. And uh, so he said, so you believe, and he, and he, he listed a few things, and I, I said, yeah, you know, the, the things in the Bible that are, like, massive leaps of faith, Jonah, Noah, Moses, you know, everything Jesus quoted that makes us have to believe it. And we're like, oh, like Jesus risen from the dead, you believe this. Yeah, and he came at me strong. And uh, then a while later, he said, yeah, man, can we meet for breakfast sometime? I talked to you. I'm like, oh, great. And so I, I sit down with this guy, and we talk over. He said, I got a couple questions about some things we've talked about in the past. And he, he, he would talk it over. He would ask his questions. I would answer those questions the best I could. And every time I would go to one of those meetings, I would pray to the God of heaven and earth for help. Like, Lord, help me. Give me wisdom. Give me scriptural recall. See, that's why it's important to, ha- to kind of know where to find things in the Bible. I'm not saying I'm like some photographic memory, but I'm saying there wasn't a screen with verses in that restaurant. And I needed to know the Bible, and I'm like, man, Lord, help me. And I would pray, and I would ask God, help this conversation, soften his heart, open his mind in a way that only you can do, and I cannot. Conversations began to happen. More questions would ask. We would have meetings And I felt like we were kind of friends, even though we were wildly on the opposite ends of this thing called the cross of Jesus Christ. One day he came, he said, I'd see him sitting in church sometimes, and I'd be intimidated, I'd fumble around in my sermons, see, nobody knew it, but I'd see him, I'd be like, oh man, I'd think through everything I was saying, I'm like, what's he thinking of what I'm saying right now, you know, I'd have to ask God for help to just preach the word, you know, get out of your own head. He came to me and he said, uh, I see it. I've come to understand it. I believe that the Bible is true. I believe um, that Jesus Christ was crucified for our sin, that he rose from the dead. I believe it. Am I supposed to be baptized then? Engineer, right? What do I do next? (laughs) And I'm like, "You, you believe this? And he's like, I believe it. Is that what I'm supposed to do, to declare it? And I'm like, yes. <laughs> when can I get baptized? And six years ago, I, I baptized him. I asked him the question, have you believed in Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord? And he said boldly, yes, I have. He was baptized. He was redeemed, saved, and changed. And now it is his mission. He is put together with the same fire and militancy a case for the word of God and the authenticity of the resurrection of Jesus Christ to share his faith at his job, with his peers, with his friends, and with his former fellow atheists. He's sitting right over here, my good friend Brent Deep. He's incredible. Just incredible. Love this guy. Love this guy. Sat at lunch with him a couple days ago. He was talking about how he's just so passionate about taking the word of God and sharing it in people's lives. By the way, if you've got some militant atheist friend who don't know what to do, see him after. He's the biggest, broadest guy in the room. That's him. And he'll sit down with them and show them the truth. I have shared stories like this that someone said one time, are you writing that down? I'm like, no. So I started writing it down. I started writing it down. So I keep this journal and I write things like it down. So I got all these pages of things God did testimonies of what God has done and who he is and his power. I think of this like a baton. It's just how I've seen God authenticate who he says he is and what he says he can do. And one day, I don't know who it's for. I really don't. I don't know who I'm writing to or what group or people or my kids or some pastor. I don't know who it's for. But one day, my shift will be over and I want to hand this and go, this is what I've seen God do. You're going to need to know this one day. Lean on the word of God. Trust in the power of God. But I'm here to testify to the fact that those things that he says are real. Here's how that happened. Take a look. Because you're going to wrestle through it one day. You're going to struggle one day. You're going to question things one day. And he is who he says he is. And a baton in my life, you know. 
goes through these guys. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, Manasseh, Ephraim. Joseph. His example of his faith up to the day he died. We carry our faith by example. The Bible says in Deuteronomy chapter 11, talking about the, the, the word of God, it talks about impressing these words on the hearts and the souls of the generation to come, on ours and theirs. You impress it. You can't make them believe, but you can impress upon them the truth. The Bible says in Deuteronomy eleven nineteen, 19, you shall teach them. That's our job. You shall teach them to your sons, the truth of God, the word of God. Talking of them while you sit in your house. That's where you teach it in your life. Where you go and what you do. When you sit in your house, when you walk along the road, and when you lie down, and when you rise up. Everywhere you go, everything you are, God is with you. God is a part of that. God is in your language, in your conversation, in your decisions. What do, you, what do you talk about when you're in your house? Think about that. You shall teach them to your sons, talking of them, the things of God, when you sit in your house. What, what is that conversation? You think about that. That's where a baton of something gets passed. In your house. If I said to the kids, what do you know of God just based on what your parents talk about in their house? What response is coming back? The Bible says you shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. People come to your home and something about your life, something about what you, you know, we put on our walls, us people, what we prioritize, right? What, what matters, what we deem beautiful. Our decor in our homes and in our life, your cars, your offices, that's what we deem important. The pictures we hang, the things we celebrate. Those are things that we say, this is what we like to look at, this is what we like to meditate upon, this is what we think is beautiful and true and powerful and inspirational in our lives, and we hang those things up. Does that have anything to do with God? That reveals something about our heart. What they're saying there in Deuteronomy, you shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. When people come, they know who you are. They walk in. They don't have to just be invited to church with you and sit next to you in church to understand who you are. All they really need to do is drive down your driveway and knock on your door. And when they come in, they should know in whom you have believed. They should come in and feel your faith. Feel it. Hear it. Watch it. They look. They go to your house and they say, may I use the restroom? And they get up out of your living room, walk through your kitchen and go to the restroom. And have they read the scripture? And I'm not saying it's a command that if you don't have verses on the wall, you're in sin. But you get the point. Do they feel, do they see God and his truth in your life? Or is it just about a vacation that you took? Is it just about our experiences and our own view of ourselves? Think about that. Bible says in verse 21, you do these things so that your days and the days of your sons, your children, may be multiplied on the land which the Lord swore to your fathers to give them as long as the heavens remain above the earth. There is an example to be lived by us, a testimony. In some ways, I hear people say sometimes, our lives should be a letter of the word of God to be read to be seen and read by all men. We pass that baton by our example. Which brings me to Titus chapter 2. The Bible admonishes men and women here in what we're called to be in our faith. The Bible says in Titus chapter 2 and verse 1, but as for you, you the believer, you the redeemed. You know, look, nobody's faulting the sinner for acting like the sinner. So understand, I, I'm not talking about, I'm going to say many things here in a second. 
It's not about the sinner acting like a sinner. They are doing, as the Bible would say, what is in their nature to do. This is talking about the redeemed. Those of us that say and profess, we know Jesus as our Lord. As for you, if that's you, as for you, men and women, speak to things which are fitting for sound doctrine. Is that what comes out of your mouth? Is that what your life speaks? That which is fitting for sound doctrine, true teaching. That's what your life should project. The Bible says, begins to give descriptions as to how this is to look. Older men are to be temperate. It's talking about the older men. It's, all, it's forming a type of almost like a mentorship relationship from generation to generation. Older men, it says, are to be temperate uh, or, or, or steadfast. Understand that word, steadfast, kids? Probably not. It's okay. It wasn't that long ago. I had to look it up myself. So for the eight-year-olds in here, uh, this is what it means. Um, this guy... This is, let, me, let me read the rest of the verse. Older men, older men are to be temperate, dignified, as you say, worthy of respect. Worthy. Not because they demand it, not because out of people are afraid or they'll get you know, yelled at or chastised. They walk in and because of their, they are dignified in the Lord, they are worthy of respect just because they showed up. Sensible, not foolish. They don't have uh, wild swings of recklessness in their life. They're sensible. They're grounded. The Bible says they are sound in faith, these older men. They know what they believe and why they believe it, and that has been tested through trial in this man's life. He is sound in his faith, faith this older man, in love. He is sound in faith. He is sound in love. He understands love as the word of God has described it, and he walks it. He doesn't say it. He doesn't keep it on the surface. It isn't all about what he feels in a given moment. I don't love you anymore. He realizes what the word of God said, and he walks it. He is sound in love according to the word of God. In perseverance, he's not a quitter. This older man, he is pushed through the fires of life. Some of you right now are probably in a fire of life. You've been alive very long. What's the book of Job said? You're born a few days and you're full of trouble. So it doesn't take long to feel the flames in this world. Trial. It says temperate, he's steadfast, which means he has gone into the storms of life and he wasn't rattled. He might have faced down fear. He might have struggled. He might have cried out to God. He might have been knocked off balance for a moment. But because he is sound in his faith, he relied on the word of God. He called to the Holy Spirit that strengthens him. And he stood in the face of the hurricane of life over and over and over again. And people stood behind him safe and stable because he blocked the wind. Older men, what's it say? Are to be. That's what they're to be. To show the young men what it looks like. That's a ministry in the body of Christ. A needed one. There is a desperate need for some real, mature, sound in faith, humble-hearted, dignified, worthy of respect, men of God in this world. There is a need. Some people, I think they get older and they think, man, I don't know what my purpose is. I see the young people doing this and the young people doing that and the pastor looks like he's 15 and, you know, it's like, you know, it's like, what, what, what do you do? I just don't know what there's there for me. That's what's there for you and that's a huge job to come along the young man, whether it's your son I don't have any children. I, I, no, no, no. Then, then there's then sons in the faith all around you. Find some kid in the youth group. Some young husband struggling through it. Doesn't have a clue. Wants, it, wants to have a win. Wants to see what God said marriage is supposed to be, but doesn't know how to really do it. Doesn't know how to apply it. It's still growing and struggling through. He's in the fight of his life. 
Where, where's the older man to come alongside and say, man, can I meet you once a week? Can, can we meet? I just, I'd, I'd like to get to know you a little bit. And with, not because you're a know-it-all, not because you know, you're arrogant, but out of dignity, out of sound faith, because you have been tried by fire and walked through and you have seen God and you have a baton to give to somebody. You come along and you put your arm around this guy. You say, man, brother, how long have you been married? Yeah, how's it going? Shoot straight with me. How's it going? Why do you think that is? Have you ever, would it be okay if I opened the Bible and told you something? Because I remember when I was you. Man, I was in the war of my life. And then and the guy said, whoa, what happened? What happened? You're still married. You're happily married. Maybe it's not about marriage. Maybe it's about serving. Maybe it's about struggles at his job. Maybe it's about being a witness. Maybe it's about getting control of his rage or his immaturity. What would you do? What would you do? That's a ministry. That's what it says older men in the body of Christ are to be. I've had some men like that in my life. I still do. I still do. Man, there's this guy. No know-it-all. I'm not, that's not false humility. I just have seen my own ignorance up close and personal. And there are men. Some of them are sitting in here, and I look to them. I'm like, that's, that's where man is. That's where godly man is. I've been pastors in my past. That's what a godly man is. That's what a bold preacher is. That's what righteousness is. That's what consistency is. This guy's in the pulpit. I'll just say that because that's what I am as a preacher. So I look to guys like that sometimes. This guy is in the pulpit. What he is at home. This guy's children aren't a wreck. This guy's wife truly loves him. It's not a fake. I look to that because I, I don't know all of that. So I look and I want, I want, I aspire to that, but I don't know all of what that walk looks like. There are a lot of us younger guys out here. And there are a lot of older guys here waiting for you to come and offer. So look, look around. I mean, find, find, look at the young husbands and the young guys and the young cows. Look at the people leading worship. I think about what our society portrays, you know, as an older man, what they get to look forward to. Oh, yay, retirement. Again, I'm not mad at sinners acting like sinners. I'm not mad. Grace of God, they need to be redeemed. The Bible says the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit. So you're yelling at them as though they are a follower of Christ and they're not. You're just hurting your testimony. What I'm talking about are people that proclaim to know Jesus and act like that. Society holds us up. Man, when you get to retire, this is what you get to do. And, and man, I've been on the golf course. I've seen it. I'm not against golf. But I see the guys are so excited. Retire so they can play golf every day. 87 holes a day. <laughs> Drunk half the time. Literally. Literally with their old college friend before they got married and lived a life. All they've been waiting for for 35 years is to get back with their college buddies and act exactly like they acted when they were 19 years old. So they get on the golf course, they get belligerent, say crass, perverse things to the girl driving the drink cart. Dude, you're 65. Really? You're that guy? You're the guy that comes home late, stumbling in, falls in bed with your wife if you've been commenting on a young women that could be your granddaughter. You're, you're going to be that guy? That's what older, that's dignified, that's what dig, that's temperance? And then what, worship God on Sunday? What's the matter with you? Are we for real? You're getting pulled over, get a DUI at 60. Get a hold of yourself. Get a hold of what you are to be. Someone's watching. That's your baton. This is what it looks like. This is what a husband is. This is what a grandfather is. This is what dignity is. Come on. Someone's going to take that baton and run with it. Isn't it something? Whew. We look at her. I, all right, I, she, she'll, tell, she'll go like this and put the brakes on. You know, the, <laughs> see, this is a hot button for her, though, so she's just sitting there like this. <laughs> I 
Isn't it something? You know when a dignified, godly man walks in, don't you? You know when you're in the presence. I'm not talking about he's Jesus. I'm talking about he is submitted to his Lord. You know that man when he comes in the room. Those, those, those other monkeys I'm talking about look like the teenagers they are when that guy comes around. And even they know. They, they, they look like, oh, they, 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 because godliness has entered the room. He doesn't have to speak. He's not the loud guy. He's probably the quiet guy. And he comes in, dignified, maybe gray hair, maybe no hair. Aaron was cutting my hair the other day. She's like, man, getting gray. I'm like, getting old. She said, maybe dignified. <laughs> Got a little ways to go yet. But he comes in. He's mature in his faith. He's not just mature in age. Age has nothing to do with maturity. Nothing to do. If you, you, know, I, I, you know how many years I've been around? Well, I don't know why you've been acting dumb for all those years, but that's not maturity. Age is not maturity. Submission to the Holy Spirit brings that godliness, growth, sound in faith. He walks in and everyone looks like, this man, if he speaks, we should listen. Where he walks, we should follow and take notes. What he does in his home, we should figure out how he does that and where he got that and how the word of God showed him that. That guy, that's the guy. Older men are to be. The ministry to be had. Well, as fun as that was, let's go to the women. <laughs> Verse 3. Older women, likewise, all that stuff. All that stuff. Older women, likewise, are to be reverent and is respectful. We could talk about reverence a lot. Holiness. Submission to her Lord. She's not a malicious gossip. She's not enslaved to much wine. She's not a drunk. She's not a partier, acting like a college girl. Which, by the way, college girls, you, you don't need to act like that either. There's, there's, no need, there's no expectation for you to waste that time being a witness, but different message. We're talking about older women right now. She teaches what is good. According to what? The word. Because she has learned it. All her life, she spent time in it. She grew in it. She allowed it to convict, to prune her, to change her, to grow her. And she teaches what is good now because she is now an older woman. Called to this. These older women, verse 4, so that they may encourage the young women. It literally says, have a relationship with the young women. Maybe it's your daughter, maybe it's not, maybe it's her and other people. She's a young woman. Encourage the young women to love their husbands. Again, according to the word of God. To love their children according to the word of God. Because the young women, just like the young men, struggle to fully understand what that means. How that plays out. Older women have wrestled that down. Older women of God, that is. Older women sound in faith. They have wrestled that down. They have walked through those trials. And they are to show a young woman what it is to love her husband. Verse 5, show that young woman how to be sensible. Not erratic. Pure. Workers at home. Kind. Being subject to their own husbands. She follows his leadership well. Even when he's wrong, she follows, encourages, and prays for that husband well. There are older women that know what it is to walk that line and to see God work and witness his miraculous power, bring about change, bring about godliness, bring about better spiritual leadership in her husband. She's done that for maybe 50 years. And then you got the girl who's been married for two and just doesn't quite know. Where's that woman? Why? Why would you do all that? So that the word of God will not be dishonored. She shows that young woman how to act so that young woman does not live a life that dishonors the word of God. Wouldn't that be something? 
older women accepting that they're older women. And I'm not saying you don't. Just preaching a sermon here today. Is he talking to me? <laughs> Sensible. <laughs> Just accept. I'm an older woman. That's good. Why is it bad? Why, why, the, why the cloaking of the age thing that happens? Why, why are we acting like the world acts and valuing what the world values? That's good. Accept it. Look at it. Look at the job that you now have, a high calling that you now have, a high calling from Almighty God to show. Now my role is to show these young women what it is to not dishonor the word of God. Because just like the men, the world is in desperate need of some godly women, mothers, wives, servants in the church and the family of God. Desperate need of some older women too that don't want to believe that they're teenagers anymore. It says sensible, reverent. She's measured in her words. What's the Bible say? Uh, uh, Proverbs 31, 25. She clothes herself in strength and dignity. Strength and dignity. She's not dramatic. She doesn't collapse in tears every time something happens, good or bad, so that she can get the attention that she wants, so everyone falls all over her. It's not a godly woman. Let's say we can't cry, we can't express emotion. What's, what's the matter with you? Get a hold of yourself. Do we know the Lord Jesus or not? Do we have stability in the storm with the Lord Jesus or not? We act in like. She's not obnoxious. She doesn't cackle and laugh so loud so people, oh, she's here. Great. <laughs> Strength and dignity are her clothing. Women wearing their daughter's clothes. Sister, the ship done sailed. <laughs> it's over. Hang up that prom dress. Put on strength and dignity because some young women need to know what that looks like. Put it on. Be an example. Run that baton better. Run that baton well because young women are all going to turn into old women and they need to know what it is to be godly and they need to know who their example was so they can say, now that I'm older, I want to be like this person that ran in front of me and now they're gone. I got the baton and I want to hand it well to this one and this one and this one. I don't want to hand foolishness. I don't want to hand a boisterous woman to this. I don't want to hand disrespect. I don't want to hand immodesty back here. What I want to hand is something that glorifies the Christ that has carried me through. We are examples, baton carriers in here. If you're young, look for someone showing you what it looks like. If you're old, who you got? Let's bow our heads this morning. I just want to take a minute. I just want to take a minute, maybe just for prayer. We got some people be glad to pray for you. If you need prayer after I pray here this morning, I'd, I'd love you to just walk up and say, hey, can you pray for me? I, I'm an older man. I'm an older woman. It doesn't matter what you think. If you, if you feel like you fit that, and there are younger people behind you you're burdened for, say, man, maybe you want to just say, hey, maybe you need to pray for God to show you. Say, Lord, I didn't realize. I didn't realize this was a, a ministry, a calling on my life. I I didn't realize, I have not accepted that very well. I haven't engaged that all the way. Can you show me, God, if there's someone that can follow after me, that I, that I, that I can follow you, Lord, and exemplify that to them? Can you show me who that is? Maybe there's some young people here. By young people, I'm not talking just about the kids, but definitely am talking about the kids. But maybe I'm talking about the young man struggling, and you think your marriage might end soon. Young woman, marriage and motherhood, singlehood as an adult in the world, maybe it's been a war zone. Say, so it, can't, it can't be like this. This is what it's like? I, how, how do these women make it? Maybe you need to pray for God to show you one that can help you. Father, I just pray right now. I just, we just come before you. We've got the baton in our hand. 
Apostle Paul said he has run the race, he has finished his course. Man, Lord, we want to do that. Oh, I, I want to do that, God, I want to do that. Somebody of that older generation, Lord. 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, I don't know. Maybe for the first time in a long time, Lord, I just pray you'd show them what their ministry is. They've been asking questions. Maybe they're done holding babies in the nursery. Maybe they're done chasing kids in the elementary ministry. Maybe they can't walk foreign soil in some hot country and share the gospel anymore, so they ask, Lord, is there still purpose for me? Show it to them right now, God. There is a high calling for them, a high calling. Stir them up, convict them, challenge them. Bring that person to them, identify it in their life. The young people here, God, people like me, other people newly married, brand new parents, engaged, young men, young women. Help them find that example of what a Christ follower is. What dignity, godliness, holiness, righteousness, what it looks like to walk this world and not compromise those things, to persevere and not quit. Help us to be the church in this way. That we would hand it down and hand it down and you would find it done well, pleasing in your sight. In Jesus' name, amen.